Math education has been under attack for a long time. Why do you feel like this is so important yeah. for us to turn around? The top indicators of success in post-secondary STEM are number one, spatial reasoning. The second indicator is your ability to abstract. Right. Is this widely understood? The short answer is yes. Felt very binary, right? Headset or no headset. For the first time, VR is comfortable, it's safe. Majority of our students are not doing well, that it's not access to knowledge that kids are missing. Mm -hmm. It's access to experiences, confidence, mindset, and belief in themselves. All right, so I was at a conference early this year and I met this incredible founder. Her name is Anarupa, and she told me this really shocking statistic. So here it goes. 70% of US eighth graders are not proficient in foundational math. Let me just say that one more time. 70% of US 8th graders are not proficient in foundational math. 70%. So naturally when she told me this, I had to bring her into chat about this problem and why it's so important to turn around. Because her company, Prisms VR, are actually trying to fix this problem using mixed reality. And that was after she had her own aha moment after realizing that one of the best indicators of math proficiency is spatial reasoning. So why not use spatial software? And as Anna Rupa says herself, Algebra 1 is a civil rights issue of our time. At the middle school level, math scores drop three to four times um, how much literacy score drops. So you, okay. you don't hear Americans walking around saying, I can't read. Yeah. But you have a mass epidemic of, of people walking around saying like, I don't know how to calculate the tip. So can this additional dimension finally level the playing field? Let's find out. As a reminder, the content here is for informational purposes only should not be taken as legal, business, tax, or investment advice, or be used to evaluate any investment or security, and is not directed at any investors or potential investors in any A16Z fund. Please note that A16Z and its affiliates may also maintain investments in the companies discussed in this podcast. For more details, including a link to our investments, please see a16z.com slash disclosures. at the beginning. Prisms VR, you are a solo founder. You're doing this alone. How did this all begin? Thanks so much for having me. So Prisms was very much born out of my lived experiences as a teacher and a district leader. Um, after a decade of teaching and leading math instruction across Boston and New York, I became convicted that we don't have the tools to close mm -hmm. the learning gaps at scale. You may know this, but today about 70% of US eighth graders are not proficient in foundational math. I did not know that. That's a stat. It's a stat, and though it's um, it dropped eight percentage points pre-pandemic, you're looking at 60% of U.S. eighth graders were not proficient, and despite billions of dollars going into this problem, mm -hmm. the numbers were static. And so as I began to kind of look more deeply into why this was happening, uh, I discovered that the top indicators of success in post-secondary STEM are number one, your ability to rotate 3D objects in your mind and maintain perspective. It's what, what you roughly call spatial reasoning. The second indicator of success is your ability to abstract. Um, and all that means is being able to go from like physical human experiences and describe language notation and build mathematical models, not from text on a page, not from word problems, but from your your life experiences. So I kind of looked at those two things going, huh, uh, we learn spatially and we learn by abstracting up yeah. from our day to day lives. We have not found a way to scale either of these methodologies. So Prisms was, was born to scale these two key competencies right. and hopefully fundamentally and radically and quickly close the achievement gap in math and science. Right. Is this widely understood? Because, I mean, you said this was discovered in 1970. Why haven't we seen this translate into the classroom before? Well, there, there are a couple things there. It's been widely understood in the research community. And I think the last few decades in education reform has seen a, a huge lack of translation of what the research has shown to actual tools and solutions. Mm. That's been primarily dictated by the tech. So, so far, computing devices have mainly been on 2D screens, That's and right. we were digitizing learning mechanisms that were possible using the computational devices we had. And now with the advent of spatial computers um, and mobile VR and XR technologies, we now finally have the natural interfaces where we can scale mm -hmm. learning with your body learning using six degrees of freedom, using a multitude of tactile tools before jumping to an equation which is very abstract. If we are seeing math scores stagnant 
or yeah. declining. Yeah. Let yeah. me just hear this from you. Why do you feel like this is so important yeah. for us to turn around? I think that math education has been attack, uh, under attack for a long time of mm -hmm. why do kids need to learn algebra? Why do kids need to know percents and ratios? And just let's let, let set the record straight. Bob Moses had shared this in the, during the civil rights movement. Algebra 1 is a civil rights issue of our time. Mm. I'm a math ed person, so from, from my perspective, it's, it's top, essential. It's essential. Not only is it tied to... Um, salaries over time and, and, and earnings over time, it's of course tied to just the types of jobs that you have access to. You don't do well in Algebra 1, you are not taking chemistry, physics, biology. Mm -hmm. If you are not succeeding in chemistry, physics, biology, you are not going on to the applied mathematics or the medical sciences. So you're just kind of cut off from a very large swath of jobs in our economy. Yeah, and pretty early. And right? very early on, yeah, because yes. students take um, Algebra 1 at the eighth grade level. Yes. So then you get tracked at the high school level. Um, and you know, grade seven to 12 is when you are training for whatever you're going to kind of contribute to and, um, and apply for in your senior year of high school. So let's jump back to the why now. It does feel like we're at an inflection point. Apple released their Vision Pro or mm -hmm. at least, you know, mm -hmm. showed the world what was coming. Um, and it does feel like maybe, maybe we're mm -hmm. at an inflection point with VR. But tell me more about how maybe we're at the right time mm -hmm. where this technology can really change things. So with the uh, release of mobile VR, which is this idea that you aren't, you don't need to be connected with an umbilical cord to a bulky piece of hardware. Mm -hmm. In its previous generation, it was really hard. Like every kid had to have this like big laptop connected to their headset. They couldn't move around. Computational abilities were 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 pretty limited. Movement tracking, hand tracking, all of that just made it very clunky and frankly uncomfortable. So that was never going to scale. Mm -hmm. um, and so with just all the work that's been done for the first time, VR is comfortable. It's safe. There's a psychological safety that's now come mm -hmm. with all of the work that's been done around UI um, and accessibility. And then I would say uh, with, with respect to Apple's um, announcement, what they've now done is taken a lot of the standard text interfaces and UI that we are so comfortable with using our iPhones, using our laptops, and made it spatialized. Um, it's mixed reality where we are able to kind of be in our physical space and use a multitude of, of interfaces in a spatialized environment, which I think is, is just critical to getting a lot of people very quickly using the medium. Yeah. So I'm now able to kind of like control my level of immersion. So if I want to be in VR, fully immersed, focused, shut the world out and be in a new space, I can do that. Yeah. And I can turn my dial and then move to augmented, come back to my space, move to MR, um, where I can kind of have my FaceTime up and, and, and be in my living room. So I think that the power of now is the, the, the seamlessness through which we can move through the different modalities, whereas before uh, VR was more niche because it was, it was VR or bust. It felt very binary, right? Headset or no headset. And then even when we talk about spatial computing, it was this paradigm of like, is it going to be AR or is it going to be VR? And it feels like what you're pointing towards is it's, it's not binary. There's a spectrum yeah. and, you know, for different applications, you're going to use one or the other. Prisms is is in VR. So you're, you're fully immersed, if I understand that correctly. And you have developed this application and it's in schools already, right? So kids are using this. What are you seeing in terms of whether it is actually changing that that data point that we were seeing before about math comprehension math reasoning is this spatial paradigm that we are now in changing that equation the short answer is yes we launched to schools in in uh fall 2021 in that time with a very small team we're already across about 160 school systems across wow. thir over over 30 states and so when i think about the greatest value that our students have shared with us is relevancy when okay. you get to immerse yourself, like leave the four walls and go to the Himalayas in India to build new elementary schools that create, create shaded regions as an architect, they're able to fully build an, an identity, mm -hmm. which you cannot just by kind of looking at things in a highly abstract way because you aren't doing it. It's not with your body. So that's like the first thing that uh, people have shared with me around just the value of pure VR. The second kind of big value that, that our communities are sharing with us is the ability to physically derive these math equations that meant nothing. Why is it equal to MX plus B? Where did it come from? <laughs> kids, don't, kids have no idea where it came from. So wh what this has kind of culminated into is uh, Wested is our research partner. We've conducted two big studies with them. One was a feasibility at scale study. That showed um, a couple things. One, double digit growth outcomes on proficiency, algebra one proficiencies, which we just talked about right. is an important uh, problem to, to, to tackle head on. But what was even more compelling in that study, Stephanie, was teachers at scale were saying, 
this um, topic takes me four weeks to teach. My kids got it in one. Wow. So we drilled in on that. And we're like, well, why? Yeah. And they and they kept saying, well, we just saw it. Because we saw it, we couldn't unsee it. That was something kids said very often. Um, so that drove into our randomized control trial where we had we set up a control group and treatment group. That was across about 30 sites. It was a very large, it was a much larger study. Um, and that showed 11% growth between control and treatment on algebra proficiencies on end of, end of mm-hmm. unit assessments. And whether we like it or not, uh, future opportunity is still governed by standardized assessments. So we can't take that moral high ground of, you know, um, progressive methods like problem based learning. Yes, we do all that, but we also have to deliver outcomes for kids, yes. which is why that's that's the line that our solution has tread around. We are here to not only expose students to real world issues in the world, build identities as architects and designers and builders and microbiologists so they can make that choice to contribute to those fields in university. Um, but also, we, we're going to get you past those tests in a far more efficient and enduring manner so you don't end up hating it because God yeah. knows, um, you know, the, just test preparation, it's, it turns off so many children oh from, from math and science. Especially math. Oh, my gosh. I, I loved math. But I just remember being in high school and so many kids had just, yeah, it was like a binary decision. Like, oh, I'm not succeeding in math. So, like, as we talked about, that world was just completely shut off from possibility. Mm -hmm. And so just to to ground things, you said you're seeing an 11% improvement. So that's after how much time? And then also just remind me, how much were we seeing those scores sliding up until now? Yeah. So uh, in at the middle school level, math scores drop three to four times um, how much literacy score drops. So you, you don't hear Americans walking around saying, I can't read. Yeah. But you have a mass epidemic of, of people walking around saying, like, I don't know how to calculate the tip. That's a percent. Right. And that's a that's a great six standard. Mm-hmm. And so um, I say that because, yes, it's been under like real duress <laughs> for quite some time. Uh, and so a 12, 11 uh, percent increase for a, a first generation deeper technology product is pretty unprecedented, which is why our research partner was so excited. Yeah. We're now putting in a larger full year um, study. You asked about the time of, of the study. This was over. A, it, was, it was studied from September through um, March. Teachers implemented multiple units linear functions, systems, and mm-hmm. and exponential functions. So now what we want to do is, though this was technically a year-long study, we want to actually get more methodical about it and do a full year-round study where teachers do every single module right. and we do the end-of-year uh, proficiency test, whereas in this one we were doing unit-wise proficiency tests where we would test exponential functions, linear functions, which was over the course of a seven-week unit of study. I agree with you. I'd love to see the data from a year, but one of the reasons I was asking that is because it's pretty – incredible that you're seeing that level of gain in that short period Mm -hmm. of time. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like you're focused on math currently, um, but I'd love to get an understanding of whether you do think this can extrapolate Mm -hmm. to other fields or if you do think that the spatial nature of VR is uniquely suited to adapt to math and maybe some forms of science. So all of biology, chemistry, uh, physics, it's the same idea, Stephanie. Mm -hmm. You experience something in the world and then through a problem that you believe is important to solve, where if we solve it, the value will accrue to the public and communities and human beings stand to benefit, um, you learn math and science. So you experience something and then you mathematize and model it. So it's the same pedagogy. Uh, We've gotten a lot of requests from our schools for the humanities. So we are starting production uh, for English and and the the social sciences. So for Mm -hmm. example, um, so much of creative writing and and, uh, uh, and essays, like where we've been doing a lot of prototyping around putting kids on a colony in Mars. They've never been. They don't know what that feels like. They don't know what that looks like. And they come out and they write because now you, your imagination has opened up. Um, for the social sciences, it feels a bit more obvious, like really taking folks to the seat of these key moments in history and learning about the perspectives and the series of events that happened. And again, those those visceral visual remembrances are so powerful versus like dates and terms that you very, very quickly forget, which is why across the subject matter, not just in math, there's a lot of reteaching that happens. Mm-hmm. So what's happening is we have a very inefficient educational system because kids are constantly reviewing and relearning what they learned two weeks ago. Yeah, And that is what PRISM is trying to diminish. I always joke, Algebra 1 is going to go from a year-long course to a two-month course. 
Wow. Because it because it's it's just stuck with so much inefficiencies right now of more worksheets and more drill and kill. The drill and kill you aren't, you're not going to need to do as much if you get what a linear function is. If you actually understand, understand it. it. Oh my gosh, this yeah. conversation is just reminding me of my education. I think back to literally the calculus test that I would have, and you know the things that you're explaining that I'm imagining now in VR, like you know you're you're swinging down a zip line and like it you're going at this speed and like that was described on a piece of paper you know, in a paragraph. And then I had to draw out what was happening in this 2D plane with my pencil and paper. And so I guess what I'm getting at is that I think, and let me know if you uh, you disagree, like the idea of what we were doing in the past, pen and paper, is just going to seem so outdated. It's going to seem almost silly to a degree that we didn't extrapolate that to the 3D world now that we have it. Yeah, I, I think that... Um... You know, I taught a lot of students with IEPs and different disabilities when I was a teacher, and I would look at some of these IEPs, and, and it would it would say things like, "Well, the student needs to visualize," and I would be like, "That kid and everybody else, the student <laughs> needs to they have ADHD they need to move around." No, people people need to move. We haven't evolved yeah. out of moving. So, my kind of what I where my mind went to when you were talking was things that have been handicaps, things that people have just kind of internalized as like, this is a problem with me. We're going to now normalize those and opening up all these modalities. Yes, there are still some people that learn through paper pencil, Mm -hmm. but let me tell you, it's not the vast majority. It's about 10 to 12% of the population. I learned traditionally I was fine, but I am not the majority. Majority of our students are not doing well. The health of math class is not good. My creatives, my athletes, people that look at the world in a fundamentally different way using their senses, they've been shut out. So what this is going to do is just create an amazing um, kind of access point for more people as we open up the modalities. It feels like there are probably many problems to be solved, jobs to be done within the education space overall. And since you only have so much time, you're building this company as a solo founder. I just love to hear if there are any other gaps that you see that you'd love to see other founders address or tackle, whether it has to do with spatial computing or otherwise. Yeah, I think that it's something that already numerous founders founders are working on. Uh, the, The jury's out on exactly kind of how those technologies will land. But the biggest area for focus for us in the next chapter is going to be the the use of AI. Mm-hmm. So right now, our characters in our environment, it's, it's you have characters you're interacting, they're not intelligent. And so the way that it works is we have an authored system in the, in, so whenever kids get, get, get yeah. stuck, they're able to go get help. There is a feedback mechanism for teachers, but the, the real kind of powerful end game for educational technologies is being able to not just be in spatialized environments, but have the right intelligence for students to get feedback and support at critical moments of struggle. We began to kind of do a kind of work with numerous GPT integrations and we fast realized that when you're not thoughtful about about the cognitive framework that sits upon that and get to what is a root, like when kids struggle, they don't just need to to, to get the answer on something. They're struggling because they have a lack of confidence and mm-hmm. the emotional support that these that that AI needs to provide is kind of at the heart of whether AI is going to be effective in education or not. And every great teacher knows that it's not access to knowledge that kids are missing. Mm-hmm. It's access to experiences, confidence, mindset, and belief in themselves. And until AI can solve that more human problem, I just don't think you're going to see the kind of impact that we want to see. Um, and so I think that's like probably one of the biggest open questions in edtech today yeah. is the utilization of AI in a humane and meaningful way. And so if I wasn't doing this, yeah, I'd be doing that's that. That's what you'd be focused on. But just FYI, I'm going to build that next as a part of the, the Prism's <laughs> world. So excited to see what happens next with Prism's. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for listening to the A16Z podcast. If you've made it this far, don't forget to subscribe so that you are the first to get our exclusive video content. Or you can check out this video that we've hand-selected for you. Thanks for listening to the A16Z podcast. If you like this episode, don't forget to subscribe here on YouTube to get our exclusive video content. We'll see you next time.